There was a second Dave McCormick Bob Casey debate. This one was a little bit easier to watch than the first one. I say a little bit. I think both of them changed up their strategy a little bit since the first debate. We see Dave McCormick still talking fast, but not hard to understand what he's saying this time. Not like super speed, but still fast, still seems high energy. Bob Casey, though, the speed at which he gets his words out is noticeably slower compared to the first debate. I think rather than both of them trying to get their talking points out there rapid fire, they're both choosing a little bit different method for trying to win voters. Dave McCormick certainly came off as more energetic and more educated on the issues. At least that's what I think. While Bob Casey, I think he was trying to come off as the more calm, more mature one. I think he was at least making a token effort to stop throwing as many insults around. I counted for the first almost whole quarter of the debate. The whole hedge fund manager thing was noticeably toned down. It ramped up big time in the later parts of the debate. Maybe Bob Casey just couldn't resist it. But I think in the beginning he was at least trying to be the more mature one by throwing less insults, by talking slower. Casey also had this thing he did where repeatedly he said something along the lines of back to the original question. He was trying to visibly seem like the one who was focused on point, getting to what the moderator was asking. And he did this once or twice where I, I didn't quite think it applied in that situation, but he also did it at times where it did apply. I think he was intentionally doing that to try and win more votes. A note about the moderators that I didn't really notice in the first debate. I think the moderators this time, granted I understand they were pressed for time, the debate did go longer than the one hour that was assigned for it, but still, they frequently denied the candidates' rebuttals. They often allowed rebuttals in certain situations, allowed them to just go back and forth at each other, but frequently for the sake of time, they tried to deny them rebuttals and move on to the next topic. It felt like they denied McCormick rebuttals more often. They did deny Casey rebuttals enough to make me question if they were doing that on purpose, but ultimately I think it was often enough to make me question if the moderators were letting their bias influence the way that they handled that debate. Also, potentially of note, the debate was held in Philadelphia this time, the first debate was held in Harrisburg, and definitely of note, there were three moderators, and one of the moderators was from Univision, that is the Spanish-speaking news network. We'll get into to places specifically where that had an impact later on. On to the questions. The first question was about the economy and inflation. Bob Casey won the coin toss on that, so he got to answer first. And I gotta hand it to him, I'm impressed with his ability to say this kind of stuff with a straight face. He doubled down on the narrative that the whole economic crisis we're seeing now was caused by corporations engaging in quote-unquote shrinkflation and quote-unquote greedflation. So he's saying that the entire economic crisis is caused by corporations shrinking their products and trying to keep a greater share of the profit. The moderators, to their credit, they actually had, for almost all these questions, they had specific follow-up questions tailored to the candidates. They followed up and asked Casey, how much responsibility does Trump really have for inflation? Are there other causes for this inflation that we're seeing? And boy oh boy, does Bob Casey triple down on that, not realizing that the shrinkflation thing is a symptom of higher production costs, which I think are still at least partially left over from the COVID lockdowns and all the port closures. If you remember that bottleneck on the West Coast port. Lumber prices shot up, copper prices shot up, they never went back to normal. House prices downstream from that shot up because that's construction materials. All sorts of other prices went up. And McCormick makes another good point. Not just materials, but diesel fuel. I've heard other people make that point as well. If the price of energy and the price of gas goes up, well, every single physical location uses electric, and every single long-range shipping option diesel factors in heavily to the transportation costs. So if gas goes up, if electric goes up, everything else goes up too. So McCormick says he wants to lower those energy costs, and he also wants to continue the Trump tax cuts. Casey actually called the Trump tax cuts a corporate tax cut. How much more anti-business can you get? McCormick said that Bob Casey's anti-price gouging legislation that he's proposing is eerily similar to Soviet price controls, which he's not even wrong there. It's not even that different. And that comparison, I think, was a big win for McCormick. On to the next issue, we have to talk about abortion. And it was a big sticking point for the moderators that we didn't have abortion legal on a federal level, so states are not allowed to put in abortion bans. McCormick explained to them over and over, because they tried to chase him down multiple times on this question, over and over how keeping the the decision closer to the people is more democratic, more representative for everybody. And if any individual wants to change their state laws on abortion, well, that's a lot easier than changing a federal law. The people in the state legislature are a lot easier to contact and have a conversation with 
than the people in Washington, D.C. McCormick says, similar to what Trump has been saying, he does not want a national ban, and in fact, he does want tax credit for IVF treatment. I think McCormick responded very well to the moderators trying to chase him down on this issue. Casey, on the other hand, does want national Roe versus Wade back, and of course, we get a lot of the hateful bigot controlling a woman's body, a lot of that type of stuff. Less than you would expect, but still a lot. On to a question about immigration. Now, here's the first place where one of the moderators being from Univision added an interesting twist to this debate. The first question is directed to Casey, and it was about the feeling that politicians, every four years, they come out and they pay lip service to the Hispanic community. There's this feeling that all this attention gets paid to trying to get their votes, but then as soon as they get elected, they disappear. And I think unintentionally this plays into the slogan that McCormick has been saying, Puxatani Bob only comes out once every six years for his election. Casey's response to this was a lot of rhetoric, and ultimately turning it around to saying that McCormick doesn't stand up to to his own party because he doesn't support the sacred magic bipartisan immigration bill that's endorsed by the Border Patrol. We're gonna hire all these new Border Patrol agents, it's gonna be wonderful. We will get into more about that bill later, but the question they asked McCormick had to do with rhetoric from the right wing fueling hate crime. McCormick is in a unique position to respond to this question. He is married to an immigrant. He gave a solid answer to that while still saying we have to secure the border. Illustrated how Casey is flip-flopped on the border issue, and talked about how the open border and the drugs pouring into the country are destroying our community. Casey responds in his rebuttal by saying that the magic sacred border bill will somehow solve racist rhetoric. I think his exact wording was, it will be a good initial step towards solving that racist rhetoric. I don't know how. And also he starts devolving into calling Dave a hedge fund manager. That's around 20 minutes into the debate, so congratulations to Bob Casey. He managed to go through a third of the debate without completely flying off the rails and just devolving into nothing but mudslinging. This question, though, gets us one rebuttal after another after another, and this is where it started feeling more like the first debate. The next question was about the Middle East. Um, yeah, the Middle East is a mess. Again, both of these candidates support Israel. Casey started off giving a good speech about how Israel needs to take the fight to its enemies, because it has the right to defend itself, but quickly devolves into, again, McCormick is a hedge fund manager. Oh, would you look at that? These hedge fund investments found their way to Iran. Wow. Dave McCormick is a really bad guy. McCormick clapped back on that, though, by citing the 2015 Iran deal. He says that Israel needs to target Iran's ability to fund and support terrorist groups. And that includes the U.S. no longer making deals such as the Iran deal. Also says something very interesting. Says he's seen firsthand, visited Israel and seen the IDF, and he's seen firsthand that they try their best to treat civilians in a humanitarian way. And that's about all the substance we can glean from this particular question because it quickly, again, devolves into a slug match. There was a question about each candidate's ability to vote contrary to their party on important issues. I don't think I even need to get into that. It was a complete mess. Next up, they had a question about the 2020 election, whether or not it was stolen, and the justice of the January 6th prisoners. McCormick says that violent people should be prosecuted, but we do need voter ID. Casey agrees with voter ID, but then it sort of spirals into another rebuttal match. And I think it's funny seeing how far they can get off topic with these dueling rebuttals. This one in particular turned into Casey attacking McCormick, saying that he once supported private he once supported privatization of Social Security, which apparently is supposed to be a bad thing. And then next up is a question about the border. Specifically, they asked Bob Casey to his face, why did it take Democrats so long to care about all the problems at the border? Casey takes takes this as an opportunity to talk about his magic border bill, the magic sacred bipartisan border bill, of course, and how those tricky Republicans don't care about actually solving issues, they only care about partisanship, which is why they don't support the magic sacred bipartisan border bill. McCormick rebuts this, says that he's been to the border more than Casey and Kamala. Casey defends the magic sacred bipartisan border bill again, saying that it would give the president additional authority to deal with things at the border, and McCormick comes back with the beautiful argument that Donald Trump already did that. Biden did not need additional authority, he could have just done it by executive order, and discretionary spending the same way Trump did. Now, given that the president does have this authority, without the magic sacred bipartisan border bill, one must wonder why the big emphasis on it. Well, if you saw the Kamala Harris-Brett Baer Fox News interview, they go into even more 
depth about the magic sacred bipartisan border bill in that interview. My conclusions based on that is that yes, it would have hired a lot more border agents, but it also would have let a lot more people into the country illegally. You can go watch that on your own time. And that leads us to the next place that this Univision anchor puts a really interesting twist onto this debate. The next question is about Puerto Rican statehood, specifically what Congress will do about it based on the results of a non-binding referendum that, I didn't know this, is apparently scheduled to be held in 2025. And this is where I think McCormick gives a bad answer to it. McCormick says directly, saying the quiet part out loud, he does not want Puerto Rican statehood because he knows that Democrats also want statehood for Washington, D.C., and he says that Democrats will use those four extra senators to end the filibuster and expand the Supreme Court. Now, I'll go on a little bit of a tangent and give my own opinion. In my life, I've seen a good handful of votes of the people in Puerto Rico as to whether or not they want to become a state. Often, they voted no on it. However, after looking this up, I see recently in 2020, they had a slim, slim yes vote on that, 52%. So they voted no how many times over how many decades, and gradually it's been inching more and more towards yes. I don't think 52% is enough of a mandate yet. I would say if the vote is at least 55, even up towards 60%, if they can get 60% of the Puerto Rican population to vote yes on statehood, then I don't see a way to justify blocking their application for statehood. And yes, I'm fully aware of the argument about expanding the Senate, expanding the Supreme Court. However, I will say this, denying self-determination to a United States territory doesn't just make us look like the cartoon villains, it makes us into the cartoon villains. I'm aware of the dangers if we get those two extra senators, but something I say sometimes and I really believe, if we allow ourselves to become corrupted while chasing our ideal worldview, then that ideal worldview no longer becomes worth chasing because the people who bring it about will have been corrupted. I think that denying Puerto Rican statehood for a partisan reason like this one is a symptom of the type of corruption that comes from hyperpartisanship. People on the right will disagree with me, they'll jump down my throat, but that's where I'm at. William Penn quote, what's right is right, even if everyone's against it, what's wrong is wrong, even if everyone's for it. If Puerto Rico votes 60% yes to become a state, and my party still tries to block it, then I just can't get behind that. But back to the statehood question, back to this debate between the Senate candidates, Casey is open to admitting them. And once again, he says the filibuster is an obstacle to progress. What kind of progress does he want? Well, again, he says even more background checks, even though we already have them, even though most gun crime is committed using illegally attained weapons, even though most gun crime is committed by handguns rather than the types of weapons that Democrats often try to ban. I never thought I would get this hot under the collar, but Casey just managed to do it for me. McCormick, though, must have been taking notes from the first debate. He had a little bit of a better answer prepared to what Bob Casey said about the filibuster. He said it is a check on Democrat executive power. It is a check and balance on radical left policies. Now, the next question from the moderators focuses on where energy policy clashes against environmentalism as people on the left would understand it. So we're talking about climate change, carbon credits, that kind of stuff. First up, they asked Bob Casey, hydraulic fracking is dangerous to health. Why do you support it? Casey, of course, defends his support of fracking, but he says that he wants strong state-level regulation on it. Remember, he's running for a federal Congress, not a state Congress. But then, remember, these moderators are tailoring the questions to the candidates. The question they ask McCormick is, what should storm victims in North Carolina know about McCormick's view on climate change? Of course, implying that climate change is what caused the storms there, implying that Republicans and people who support fossil fuels and oil and natural gas are evil for causing climate change, therefore causing the storms. That was sort of the implication stated, not stated. McCormick had a fun answer to this, sort of getting his way around that, though. He said that he is strongly pro-energy, he wants to export natural gas, he wants to replace coal with natural gas, and by replacing that coal energy, we would lower our carbon footprint because natural gas produces less carbon than coal. Surely people who care about carbon output are ideologically consistent enough to side with McCormick on that issue. Surely. Next up is a question about gun crime. The moderators think that guns are scary. They cite a poll that says 59% of Pennsylvanians want more restriction. I don't believe that. McCormick says that gun violence is caused by illegal guns, meaning guns that are illegally obtained. He says we should focus on mental health and school security, and he says that we should not restrict semi-automatic weapons. I agree with all that, and I'll double down and say the UK, so I'm not even talking about DC or Chicago, where it's still in America, people can bring guns 
guns from another state. I'm talking about the UK, where the country is a lot more regulated with guns. People there can still own guns, but there are more limitations, more regulations on it. What kind of crime do they have there? Oh, they have mass stabbings. They have events at fire companies where they encourage people to come and blunt the tips of their kitchen knives because they're worried about someone using the knife for a stabbing crime. What do they have? I've seen news stories about acid attacks there, people throwing acid on a bystander's face. I've seen news stories about people plowing through crowds with a vehicle. So I don't think all this focus on banning guns is the answer. I think if someone is really out there enough that they want to commit a mass casualty crime, life, uh, finds a way. I think we should be focusing a lot more on mental health, and I think we should lift a lot of the restrictions on legal gun ownership. I remember that video of the Texas church shooting from a while back, where like a dozen different church members pulled out legally owned guns, and they brought down the shooter pretty quick. Imagine if the teachers already on the scene at any number of school shootings we've seen in the past few years, imagine if one of those teachers had a concealed weapon, they could have saved dozens, perhaps hundreds, of students' lives by ending the mass shooting without even waiting for police to show up. That's what I think about gun crime. Bob Casey, on the other hand, says that the gun lobby has a stranglehold on one party. Bob Casey would like to ban assault weapons, and he would like more background checks. That's what he said directly in this debate. And that was the final question of the debate. After this, we have the candidates' closing statements. They were about what you would expect, summarizing their viewpoints. Once again, McCormick is the only one to bring up transgender sports and transgender gender bathrooms. I wish that had been talked about more in either one of these debates. Overall, I think McCormick won this more handily than the first debate. The first debate, there was sort of up in the air as to who won that one. I would lean towards McCormick, but then again, I'm a supporter of McCormick. I do hope McCormick wins. I think McCormick performed better in this debate, and Bob Casey performed about the same as he did in the first debate. Maybe a little better, but I think McCormick had more improvement from one debate to the next. As for whether this changes a lot of votes, I really really don't know. I don't know how many people are even paying attention, and I don't know if this debate came too late for some people to make up their minds.